<clears throat> Reprise du débat, continuing debate, uh, the Honourable Member for Beaches, East York. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll get to the conversation around pricing and pollution, but I want to start with a threshold question that we all have to answer, which is, do you care to take action to save our planet? Do you care to reduce emissions for our kids? Do you care? And if the answer is yes, then you get to a different question, which is, how are we going to reduce emissions in the most efficient way? You want to respect taxpayer dollars, then you reduce emissions in the most efficient way. Now, common sense, I hear a lot about common sense across the aisle. Common sense presumably should be that polluters pay. And pollution, you should know, is a, is a classic market failure. I've heard some people bandy about different economic opinions. What's a market failure? Well, in this case, the cost of polluting is costless to the polluter, and it is borne collectively by all of us. So what's the answer to that? The answer to that is a price signal. And the answer, very simply, common sense, is to make polluters pay. Now, that's what this price on pollution does. You don't want to, though, penalize people. You don't want to make people worse off. You want to change behavior. And so, matched with that price, internalizing that negative externality, matched with that price, you make sure that there is a rebate. You recycle the revenue. Now, I've heard people go back and forth on this. The fact is 90% of the revenue goes back to households directly. It's 100% of the revenue goes back to provinces of origin, 90% to households directly. If there was a motion today that says 100% should go back to households, I would vote for that motion, for sure. We could improve it. But the fact is, 90% goes back. It's largely revenue neutral. I've heard a question, does it work? Of course it works. This is not me saying this. You look at the emissions uh, progress report for 2030, and you see a, more than a steady decline. You see a decline from business as usual. So if we took no action, if we took the kind of action we saw under the Harper government, we took no action from 2015 on, we would have seen emissions rise to 815 megatons by 2030. You look at that progress report, does anyone in this House know what they stand to be with all of the action we've put in place? 467. Not nearly enough, not, not, not where we need to be, but that's a 43% reduction from business as usual. It's 36% towards our 40% target. We are very close to being where we say we want to be. A good amount, by the way, is, respond is because of the price on pollution. So you look at that progress report, it says 30% of emissions are, are come from the price on pollution. When you look at that Delta 815 down to 467, it's 23% of that total reduction from business as usual comes from the price on pollution. So yes, it works as part of a, of a very serious overall comprehensive climate plan. Now, it is easy to care about climate change when you are well fed. And I have heard lots of talk in this House that the price on pollution is making people poorer, the worst among us. It is hurting those who are already hurting. It is deeply, deeply cynical, Mr. Speaker, to trade on a real affordability crisis, to trade on the real stress and the real struggle of so many people in need to undermine effective and efficient climate action that makes most households whole. It does, <laughs> it does not increase the cost of everything to send people to food banks. We've seen, I said this in, 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 in asking a question of a colleague and I got no good answer, we've seen 20% food inflation these last two years and the price on pollution economists tell us accounts for under 1% of any inflationary impact. That is not the cause of the affordability crisis. We could have a very interesting debate about interest rates. Maybe the member from Carleton would tell us that he wants to fire the Bank of Canada governor. We could have very interesting debates about, uh, interesting debates about interest rates and what is truly driving the cost of living crisis. It is not. It is absolutely not. No economist will tell you that it is the price on pollution. We could also have an interesting debate about social welfare in this country. We've increased Canada child benefits significantly. We've brought hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty. We've increased the Canada workers' benefit. We've increased GIS for seniors. You know what provincial governments have done? Largely conservative provincial governments, they have not increased, they have not increased welfare. They have not increased disability supports in keeping with the cost of, in keeping with the cost the rise of inflation. I'm sitting, standing here in Ontario. The member could tell me 
what this Ford government has done to make sure disability payments keep pace with the cost of inflation. And guess what? They've done next to nothing. So you want to talk about the real cost of living crisis and what drives that cost of living crisis? We can talk about food inflation, we can talk about interest rates, and we can talk about the lack of provincial action in their area of responsibility. What we should not talk about, if we care about facts in this House, is the price on pollution. Now, the, much has been made, much has been made of the PBO report. I wonder sometimes, listening to the debate in this House, whether anyone has actually read this report. So let me quote from it. On a fiscal basis, on a fiscal basis, and I quote, most households will see a net gain versus the fuel charge and related GST. More, the fiscal only impact is broadly progressive. So hang on, what's this about? But the PBO says it's going to cost us more. And I will be absolutely fair in this, and there's a real debate we should have. Because what the PBO actually says is that on a fiscal basis, cash in, cash out, money that households pay, money that households get back, they are 80% of households are in fact better off. What the PBO goes on to say is that when you take into account GDP impacts from the price on pollution, we see modest GDP reductions, but significant on a household basis. So that most households are worse off if you include fiscal and economic factors. Now, they don't say that about low-income households. So again, trading on food banks, offering no real suggestions for helping people out of poverty completely incorrect even on the PBO's analysis. But, but let's, let's focus a little bit more on whether the PBO is right. Fiscal analysis is easy. Money in, money out. On an economic basis, I would say they are wrong. It is not gospel. Here's this from the American Economic Journal, for example, on the macro impact of carbon pricing. We find no evidence for a negative impact on employment or GDP growth, but rather find a zero to modest positive impact. Or this from the IMF from June. Countries that do not recycle revenues experience a substantial economic downturn, while countries that recycle revenues only display a muted impact on economic activity. For those keeping track at home, Canada recycles revenues. Worse, and this is fatal, let me quote this from the PBO as well. This, <laughs> I wonder how this is not part of the conversation. The scope of the report is limited to estimating the distributional impact of the federal fuel charge and this is quoting, does not attempt to account for the economic and environmental costs of climate change. So conservatives could maybe explain to me why we would consider the negative economic impacts on one side of the ledger of the price on pollution, fiscal impacts are better for households, we would consider the negative economic impacts, but we wouldn't consider alternative scenarios, technology not taxes, that's going to cost households more, it's going to be paid for by taxes, or, or worse, we don't take into account the real economic costs of climate change, of unchecked climate change. And let's be absolutely clear, if you don't have a serious climate plan in this country, and the federal conservatives are not interested in a serious climate plan, we are going to see unchecked climate change. And, and let's, let's return to costs. We have conservatives that have no plan. Since I have been in Parliament, they have had no plan except except for Aaron O'Toole, who was promptly ousted. Why? For having a plan. So we have, and, and technology not taxes is not a plan. If you don't have a price on pollution, what does the price on pollution do? The price on pollution says to consumers, it's going to be more expensive to pollute. Consumers will seek out cleaner alternatives and businesses respond to innovate to meet consumer demand. If you don't have that price, that is internalizing that negative externality, businesses aren't going to innovate. We aren't going to see serious climate action from the private sector. And it's going to be left, if you want technology, not taxes, if you want that, it's going to be left to government subsidies alone. And where do government subsidies come from, conservative friends? They come from taxes. So if you want your taxes to go up, ax the tax. Mm.